What's up guys? This is Derek Kirby of the Dallas Prospect and today we're going to be ta Oh, this is bad. Maybe. What is up, guys? This is Derek Kirby of the Dallas Prospect, and we have interesting Mavericks news today. Now, if you watched the game last night, you already know the Mavericks beat the Grizzlies by 10, really controlled the entire game. As much as I, and I've talked about this recently, I can't remember if I actually said it in the video I posted yesterday, the Mavericks haven't really had a lot of just taking care of business wins this year. It's not to say that they've had none. They just don't have many. They typically play down to their level of competition and mess around when they should just handle their business. Well, last night, they did handle their business, and it's especially notable because they did it in the absence of Kristaps Porzingis. Now, we have a lot to say about this. Porzingis missed the game at practice. Before the game, he experienced some lower back tightness, and so he had to miss the game. And the Mavericks actually benefited from that defensively. Let me explain. The Mavericks' defensive rating when Kristaps Porzingis is on the floor this year is two full points worse than than the 29th rated team defensively, that being the Sacramento Kings. Yikes. But when Porzingis is off the floor, Dallas's defensive rating is top five. It's that drastic. And again, this was a guy who was stellar defensively for us last year. Something does not seem right. Yes, he only got back to working out again and being able to practice at full late December, but it is bizarre that a guy who was an elite defender throughout his career, especially with regard to shot blocking, suddenly looks like a statue out there. Like he can't even get down, as one executive put it, into like a defensive stance. He's a scarecrow, I believe is the term he used. The Mavericks as a result or the 27th rated defense right now as as a collective that's you know regardless of whether or not he's actively on the floor it's bad and by no means is it all kp but for a guy whose shooting splits are pretty much in line with his career averages the defensive side of the equation has fallen off the map and now there are real conversations that have to be had about whether or not he is the ideal pairing next to luka Doncic going forward not only in this long, long line of injuries do we now have to equate the fact that, man, I get it. As someone who's had back problems, I get it. That shit creeps up and it's debilitating and it's frustrating because you can be saying to yourself, like, I, I did nothing or I, I've been doing all the right things to try and avoid this. And it just happens and now it wrecks the next week. I'm not saying he'll be out a week. He's out tonight. And that's interesting for a reason we'll get into but it sucks i get that there are a lot of people who are just like dude you you had eight days off with the storms and everything the winter storms that had postponements and all of that and yet here we are in a situation where you're not ready to go that's incredibly frustrating it is and there's reason to speculate whether or not he will ever be able to be healthy enough to fulfill his his potential you know like even as a second best player on a championship team is he capable of that the bubble kp certainly gave you reason to believe that he was or that he is perhaps but even that was dashed by a injury you know dirk dirk never had these injuries dirk's also you know seven foot not seven three i get it but it's concerning, for sure. 
So now that brings us into a story today. There are different reports saying that the Mavericks have been, quote, sniffing around the possibility of a potential Kristaps Porzingis trade, that they are quietly looking at options out there to see if they could move KP, who after this year still has three full years left on that five-year, $158 million contract, I believe it was. I almost said 78, but that immediately seemed too high. I believe it was $158 million over five years. He's got three years left after this season. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's a year and a half into this experiment. And so I'm hesitant to say whether or not we've seen enough, especially with injuries, but the injuries are kind of the story. That and the defensive drop-off and the fact that the Mavericks secure one of their more comfortable wins of the year against a team that's in the playoff hunt without him and that they looked competent without him. That's a story. Like, the Mavericks started out this game, their offense was a little sluggish. Sure, without KP, it was a little bit sluggish, but defensively, they looked like they knew what they were doing. They were up 18-5 to with, like, God, more than half of the quarter already played out. Now, part of that was Memphis was just shooting like ass out there, but at the same time, the Mavericks were taking care of business, and you had great performances going on from Josh Richardson started really hot, ended up being kind of ho-hum for the game, but started out really hot. Hardaway was his usual, I say usual, when Hardaway gets going, you know what it looks like, and he puts on a show. Hardaway did that. And then you also had Jalen Brunson going out there and cooking and kind of making a continued case for why he just deserves to be a starter. And I've been a guy who says I'm happier with him coming off the bench. I would especially point to that with regard to the offense overall seeming sluggish to be able to bring in another guy off the bench that could do that. That appeals to me. But at the same time, you know, you got to you got to pick your battles as you go. So the Mavericks secured a great win. And now we're apparently sniffing around the blocks for a KP trade. Now, there's been some connections tying him to Golden State, the Golden State Warriors. They're already in a a major cap investment situation. They're going to have to play their cards. And so people say like, well, hey, you know, if you got Steph and Clay and Draymond and KP, uh, you know, you got a lot of nice pieces there and KP style of play might fit well. And especially with uh, in a tougher kind of enforcer type with Draymond there, even if a little bit undersized of one, still very good. Having him next to KP, that kind of helps that. So what would the Mavericks be looking at that Minnesota first round pick? The, the addition of a guy like Wiseman. Those would be kind of interesting. I mean, there's certainly things to like about it, but I don't know if that's what I'm really interested in. There's there's some sense from, I believe it was an executive in an Eastern Conference team in the article, and this was an SI article, basically saying that, you know, oh, it's not surprising that the Mavericks have a little bit of buyer's remorse, but I think because of KP and how he's kind of been this year, it's not the high that was uh, KP in the bubble. Therefore, they might be able to secure a non-lottery protected or sorry a lottery protected first round pick which is to say picking anywhere 16 and down in the first round that for a return on investment on kp would not be good it it wouldn't be that's not enough for me to even remotely flirt with the idea of it you gave up two firsts and you gave i mean as far as the pieces we sent out i'm not worried about that but you gave up two first round picks and to let go of him two years, not even two years, a year and a half into actual playing doesn't feel like that's a good return on investment. I've had scenarios in which I drew up my willingness to part with KP. The problem is the way he's played, he's not going to actually be in the discussion for that. You're not going to get in a situation where you can get Bradley Beal, for instance, because of KP. Now, maybe he's the centerpiece, but you're still having to send out more. It's not like you can flirt with the idea of KP and a pick for Beal. I I would have been open to that. But now that's not really in the cards unless you really sweeten the offer with other major assets. So with that being the case, you get into different conversations here. Like, okay, what, what do the Mavericks do 
to try and build around this if they if they're looking for a second guy to pair with that now the Mavericks have had interest in Drummond granted they're from what we've heard been in the buyout market looking at Drummond that they would rather pair a presence a physical presence who can rebound next to KP and kind of supplement him that way kind of like how Tyson Chandler was a perfect fit next to Dirk he masked Dirk's defensive deficiencies and allowed him to play to his strengths he didn't it wasn't as glaring of a weakness in the Dallas interior defense when you did that. So in that way, maybe a player like Drummond could do that for Dallas. But again, I, I don't think the buyout market's going to be especially promising for Dallas in terms of getting in on Drummond. I think Drummond, if he is bought out or he does come available in that kind of manner, he's going to go to a, a more sure thing, a Nets. A, I don't know if he'd go to either LA team because they're both stacked. And the Lakers are looking at Boogie again, who just got cut today, I believe. So there's different things of that nature. And I, for the record, I think the Lakers are going to pick up Boogie because he was there before, never got to play for him because of his injury. And he's real tight with Anthony Davis, who they, I think will vouch for him and be more than enough to get him in the door. But... If that's the case, if they're looking to pair someone with KP rather than trade him, then, you know, that that might be your ideal plan, but that's not necessarily how it will play out. What is more reasonable or likely to occur? Now, other other things to consider here as I, and I'm just sifting through some of the notes here in the article. This is one potential complication that the article points out. Luca and KP are tight. It's not just that they knew each other before they ever got to the NBA. Like, they're legitimately tight. All throughout the Orlando bubble, around the hotel, whether it was at the pool or whatever, Luca and KP were frequently seen together. What's more, apparently in film sessions, if Luca is being, uh, you know, dissected a little bit in terms of his defensive presence or anything like that, or just general film session. If he's getting picked apart when things can be a little bit contentious in locker rooms and film session, you can get a little bit bristled at being dissected and feeling like you're being put you know, under the spotlight a little bit or feel like the criticism or whatever is a little bit harsh. KP takes up for Luka. KP 100% has Luka's back, almost to the point of just outright defending him at times, according to the article. So with that being the case... Yeah, they're tight. And how would Luca feel if the Mavericks dealt KP? It's it's an interesting thing. Like you saw with Anthony Davis and his situation with New Orleans, when they let Boogie go, even though Boogie was coming off an Achilles, that for him was the final straw. Like he never got over that, and it was the next year that he basically started trying to force his way out. And I think he got it, obviously, and I believe it was the summer. That feels like a lifetime ago, but I believe it was the following summer that he played one last year in New Orleans. Or maybe it wasn't even the full year. Who knows? But that was it for him. And, you know, they're tight. He didn't appreciate them letting his friend go, and he felt like it was a step backwards for the team's ability to do anything, potentially. So... Would Luca view things that way? I don't know. I mean, you got to see who they bring in. But regardless, if it's Drummond, Luca doesn't have that history with Drummond. You know, it, it's it just depends. But you wouldn't be getting rid of KP in exchange for Drummond. I understand that. I'm just saying, if you make a move, even if it makes sense on the basketball floor, you have to consider broader implications as well. Uh, let's see here. A source from the Western Conference, an executive basically wondered aloud, uh, said, I can't say that there's a contract, I, that I, that's a contract being KP's, the three remaining years, uh, that I'd be willing to pay to take on. And he says, I think you could maybe squeak out a lottery protected first from somebody. That's a capologist adding that in. You'd have to take on a mix of young players and probably some bloated veteran contracts, kind of like the Courtney Lee and Tim Hardaway Jr. contracts when you took on KP initially from New York. You'd probably be looking at something like that. Does that fit or make sense for this Dallas team? I don't think so. I really don't. I think if you were going to make a move 
anything related to actually moving KP, it has to make sense. And it has to be something that makes you better in the immediate. If you can supplement KP with a, a guy next to him, a, a true center next to him, great. You'll take advantage of that and you'll be able to cover it up and you'll be able to work with KP longer. If you don't, then okay, there are scenarios in which you're willing to part with KP, especially if the defense doesn't come around very soon. But even then, I don't know. So here's the thing. Mark Cuban commented today to Brad Townsend about whether or not the Mavericks have gauged Kristaps's trade value, and Mark Cuban says, quote, it's not accurate. We have not discussed him in a trade at all. Has not happened. Something to keep in mind with that. And this is a, a chime in from Tyler Adams or Ty Mavs on Twitter. He points out that the Spurs had a months long tampering with Kristaps Porzingis prior to Dallas acquiring him from New York. So would it be possible that the comment is related to you know the western conference executive basically saying that oh you're not going to get much of anything for him he looks like a scarecrow would that be possible to be coming from that executive maybe maybe it's it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility mike fisher elaborating on the porzingis trade story and mark cuban's reaction says that quote Somebody's been talking shit, and that's not acceptable. I think that, I think there's probably truth to that. I'm not going to say there's no scenario wherein the Mavericks haven't had some discussions, even if only internally, about KP. But I do think, more than likely, they're not actively, like, conversing or having these discussions about the possibility of moving on from him because I don't think it does them any good. Not in this scenario. Because if his value really is depleted, like it sounds like it's depleted, I don't think it makes sense to move on from him this early anyway. I think if he if he was in the last year of his deal or had a year and a half basically left, then there's a conversation, I think. But again, after this year, he's got three more on the contract. You're not looking at that. You're not looking at that for a for an acquisition. You're not looking to sell when your stock is that low and there's this much time left for it to go up. So then why would the Mavericks be sitting out KP last night and now tonight against Boston citing lower back tightness, which by the way, while it can be debilitating, it's certainly not a long-term injury, and it's a guy that doesn't have a history of back issues anyway. So what does that mean? Well, if you were trying to hold a player out from action to prevent any potential injury or further putting bad tape out there, you might consider doing that. How hard could the team have really been going after over a week off between games? Like, in practice, how hard could they have been going for him to have suffered that injury? I don't know. But the fact that he was out last night and then out again tonight, and that update came in early in the morning, like, before noon, we knew that he was out tonight. That would seem to suggest that maybe they are looking at possibilities in terms of trading him. Do I think that's the right move? I have to see what they're going to be getting for him. Unfortunately, I think the value has dropped. And while I would like to say that they would be able to still use him as a centerpiece in a major blockbuster trade, it's probably not going to be something earth shattering. Do I think it's going to be uh, the kind of deal with Golden State where... Ubre or whatever is about the best you're getting? No, I sincerely hope not. If you're getting a deal where Ubre and the, the first round pick from Minnesota is your best bet, uh, I mean, at least the Minnesota pick, you're going to be in the high in the lottery with good odds. But man, I don't like it. 
I don't like that return on investment. So we'll see. Wiseman's an intriguing proposition, but really I, I want to see what this team can do. I hope that they wait a little longer. I know the deadline's fast approaching, but I hope they wait just a little bit longer unless it's a major thing. Like you got to knock my socks off for me to be comfortable with this magnitude of a move because the sample size is still pretty small and I know everything moves fast and it's very reactionary, but we've seen when things are allowed to get into a groove, how good the one-two punch of Luca KP can be. Before KP's meniscus tear in the playoffs last year, he was an absolute monster. 30 and a half points, like 11 boards, a block and a half a game, shooting 38% from three. He was an absolute monster. And if he doesn't go down with that injury, Dallas beats the Clippers. I don't know that they beat Denver necessarily, but they beat the Clippers. So... Something to consider there. This team has, it's got a lot to like if it can just stay healthy. So either the Mavericks know something and they're trying to kind of quietly, you know, move it out the door before it can really flare up and be more public. Or I don't know, maybe this is just weird timing with the tweaked back and the timing of him sitting out as trade speculation is swirling. But regardless, we're going to have to see. Uh, I know all things Mavs is at this point leaning towards the possibility of KP being traded by the deadline. I think that's a possibility for sure. But at this point, I'm probably willing to put it at 50-50, whereas I think he's somewhere in the the 60% range. So we'll see. It's a uh, it's going to be a very interesting next uh, little stretch of time here before the deadline the next week or so. So that'll do it for this time, though. Drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From prospect to legend.